Well, well, here we are. Week what? Three? Yeah. Okay, short week. But because you guys did so great in 309, we can pretty much skip over a lot of the stuff that we had uh, normally used to have to cover. Uh, how meters work, how the dial works, how to read the meter. Yeah, we don't need to cover that. So um, as evidenced by not too many people blowing their fuses so far this semester, it appears that you guys are doing okay with that. So what we'll do instead is skip over how to read a meter, since you already know how to do that, and go right into how a meter works. Now, why would I want to teach you how the inside of this old thing works? In case you break it. What are the odds of that happening? How many people have blown their fuses? <laughs> Only two. How many people are in the class? <laughs> nah. The worst of your career is probably pretty high. Yeah. Meters are relatively cheap these days, and I doubt that you guys will even buy something that looks like this. When you get out in the field, you'll probably buy a digital one, and you'll probably buy it off Amazon and probably pay less than 20 bucks for it, unless you want a fluke meter, of which case you'll spend a lot of money, and you still have to have it calibrated, so I don't know. That's up to you. Um, but the inside workings of a meter are relevant because when it comes to troubleshooting aircraft instruments and what's going on with an aircraft, it's applicable to the aircraft. And even in an aircraft that has digital instruments, like my aircraft does now, there's still components of this that make sense when you look how it is wired externally to the, uh, to the display. You know, I had to put a shunt into mine to get my amps to work. It's just part of the install package. Like, well, what's a shunt? Well, then you start to understand stuff like that. You start to understand uh, how analog gauges work, because there's a lot of analog gauges still out there uh, from various things. Um, you know, we could talk about like oil pressure, and, and some of these gauges get really, really old. And the question would be, well, as these gauges get older and older and older, would it tend to show higher oil pressure or loyal, lower oil pressure? Well, if you know how a gauge works, you would know that most likely, if it's a boron type, it's going to get lower as things age harden. Um, then you'll start to understand what you're actually looking at on a meter. Are you re is it really an amp meter measuring, reading amps, or is it a, a voltmeter that's calibrated to read something else? Anyway, once you start to understand that, you can start to understand what's going on inside of the aircraft, and it makes more sense, <clears throat> I think. Unless this doesn't make sense to you, and then in which case you'll be like, I just don't know what he was talking about. So none of it matters. Um, but that's not the case. So let's start with voltmeters. Voltmeters. Well, what do they indicate? Voltage. All right, we are doing well then. Indicate voltage. All right. The way they work is called a movement. Speaking of movements, did you guys see where that airplane had to turn around because somebody diarrheaed all over the... Yeah. <laughs> Just glad it wasn't me. All right. All right, movements. Well, the first type one is a, an, I don't know, galvanometer, G-A-L-V-A-N-O-M-E-T-E-R. There we go. And that is, I used to try and draw these things. Now I'm like, nope, picture. Because I draw it, you're like, I don't know what the hell you just drew. So that is a simple galvanom, galvano, galvometer. That's it, ometer. Galvanometer. Oh, I got it out without hurting myself too bad. All right. So this particular one right here, it will react to very minute um, electromagnet influences caused within this this loop here. So one of the questions that a lot of you have gotten to is what are the two things that happen to a conductor as electricity flows through it? And those two things are? Heat and, Heat and a magnetic field happens. Well, that magnetic field tends to get magnified when you loop it. So by looping it, and that's what they're doing here, we're getting a magnetic field. And what this is indicating is this is a little um, Know, compass needle right there, lodestone or something like that. As you put current through this, then the little needle will move. And so it'd be a very crude way of doing something. You could say, well, if the needle's pointing towards north, 
and it's off, that's just its resting spot, then put a little current into it, it suddenly goes that way. We'd say, oh yeah, it's because there's a little bit of current flowing in there. So this is a device that reacts to minute electromagnetic influences caused within itself by a small amount of current. So let me see, a device that reacts to a small um, amount of amount of current. There we go. That creates that creates an electromagnetic field. So it's just a magnetized needle <coughs> suspended in a coil of wire. When current flows through the coil of wire, the needle will move and react. Well, we can't really measure anything with that. I mean, it's not a very useful meter, you know. It's like, well, how many volts do you have? I don't know. It just kind of spins. So we couldn't do that. So, but we can start with that. We can understand that that's basically all we're going to do is just take this concept and make it better. So all we're doing is taking a coil of wire, magnetic field, moving a needle. That's all any of them do. So now we're just going to look at how it does it. So the next thing we're going to look at is, and by the way, I had thought about deleting this section out. I thought, oh, I don't know, you know, is it really going to be useful? Uh, but then I realized, you know, it is in your textbook. And if it's in the textbook, it's fair game for your mechanics test to ask you this stuff. So the next one is the D arson ball. That's D comma arson ball or Weston meter. Or Weston. A R S O N V A L. A R S O N V A L. Meter. This would be the most common type. I shall show you a picture and then we can talk about it. So, employs a moving coil and a permanent magnet. All right, so we've got our permanent magnet right here. We've got a little north and a little south there. And this is something that really starts to introduce us to a lot of concepts that we'll be doing later with generators and motors, because this is not much different than that. And we can look at this coil right here. Well, depending on how you wind a coil and put current through there will determine which is the north and which is the south. So we're just creating an electromagnet. So really there, I guess you could say there's two types of magnets. You have permanent magnets, which is what this would be considered right here, permanent magnet. And there's different types of permanent magnets, but it's just, it's a magnet. And then the second type would be an electromagnet, which when there's no current going through it, it's off. And when you put current through it, it's on. So we have a permanent magnet and an electromagnet. And if you think about that, we have a north here and a north there and a south there and a south there. And it's kind of starts over here on zero, kind of crooked, right? Mm -hmm. This way for you guys. And so it's just gonna rest there. And as I put current through that little coil right there, the north is going to do what to the north? It's going to repel it, which we already had that. And the south is going to? <coughs> nope, south and south are going to? Repel. repel. And yeah, it's going to have to get over here, and then the north starts to attract, and the south starts to attract. So, then the, so first we have repulsion, then attraction. And back here is a little coil spring. I think maybe there's one there represented too, which kind of holds it over towards zero. And as the current comes through, it's got to fight that coil, so the, or the, the, uh, the spring. So the more current that goes through the coil, the stronger the magnet becomes, the more the repulsion becomes, the more it's going to fight the little coil spring down here, the more it's going to go towards the 10. Pretty simple, right? Okay. You're like, but, there's no but, that's just the way it is. All right. Employs a moving coil and permanent magnet. <clears throat> so 
So the needle is attached to the coil. This is probably where I could cut out some of my, <coughs> let me see. Needle is attached to movable coil. As current flows, Um, through coil north end of coil is repelled by north side of magnet a permanent of magnet and same with the south. I'll put same with S, same with south. The amount of current required to move the needle the needle will depend on magnet strength and number of turns number of turns of the coil every every time the coil makes a, a loop we call it a turn So at some point in this class, I'm hoping if you get your work done, <clears throat> you'll be working with an oscilloscope. I have an oscilloscope project for you. And an oscilloscope is a little TV screen that represents, it gives you a picture of uh, what electricity is. And I didn't plan on doing this, otherwise I would have just pulled up something really cool, but I'll just draw it. So we have a little TV screen. Well, TV screen, it'll use green. And if this represented like right here, zero volts, and we looked at DC, and we just, DC is gonna be a very straight line. I thought there's a way to make it. Yeah, oh, look at that, it's very straight line. Very straight line, there you go, DC. And we would look at that, and on an oscilloscope, this right here represents our, our value. What we'll say like volts or amps. That's how we read it. And we'll have a scale and there'll be grid lines and we would measure how far it is from here to here. And we might say, oh, with that distance and uh, how many blocks, I'll show you later. We might say, oh, that's, uh, that's 12 volts because it's you know, that far above that zero line. And so it looks like that and then time goes this way. And so what is it doing? Well, we can zoom in and we can zoom out. I could say that this is a millisecond. I could say it's a second. I could say it's an hour, depending on how far I zoom in and zoom out. But well, we could look at direct current, DC, direct current. And it's the same over time. The only way it's gonna change is if you have a battery and the battery starts to die and then it'll look a little different. But assuming that the battery is not dead and we're looking at maybe say a, a second of time here, we would see that direct current looks just like that and it never ever changes. And so that would be fine. But if we look at AC, which stands for? Alternating current. Yeah. alternating current it alternates so it'll go positive and then it'll go below that line and go zero and then go above the line and go positive and below the line it goes zero and it's just going to keep doing that so everything this way is a positive current and everything this way is a negative current so literally from here to here it's going to start at zero and build up to some positive value and drop down and go completely to zero no voltage at all 
Then it's go completely backwards, just like you took the battery and connected it the other way around. So with this right here, it happens 60 times per second. <clears throat> so 60 times every single second, it goes up and gets super bright, and then it comes down, it goes to zero, goes the other way, goes negative. So the light runs backwards for a little while. I guess that's it sucks the light out of the room. No. So it runs backwards. <clears throat> So it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and half forth. Half the time it's light and half the time it's dark. Yeah, so just it, it's not dark. Or is that how the ballast, the like ballast in the light does that? Kind of alternates it? Um, I'm not sure what the ballast is doing on these old things. I was going to say, does the uh, peak of those, uh, of those um, arts show like that's the uh, voltage of the AC current, like those peaks? Mm, well, we'll get into that later, but there's peak, peak to peak. RMS, there's all these different values within there. Okay. So what I just wanted to look at and it really bring to your attention is that it goes backwards half the time. Yeah. Is that alternate, is that the times per second that's hertz, right? Yes. Okay. So it'd be 60 hertz light. Yes. And like I said, there's, we'll get into this. I don't want you to start freaking out and you know, oh my God, this is on the test. No, so anyway, but the point is alternating curve goes back and forth, back and forth. And I tell you that, so to tell you that with this one we're looking at, this the Arsenval or the Weston meter, only suitable for, let me see, only suitable oops, for measuring DC. Well, why is that? Because as I put current through here, and run it, I get a steady north and a steady south. If you reverse it, then what happens is the north and the south reverse, and then the thing will do what? Slash. Go the other way, then it just sits there and vibrates. So if you wanted to make a little vibrating needle, that's how you would make one, which would do you absolutely no good whatsoever. So that would just sit there and vibrate and not help you at all. So it would only be good for direct current. In fact, if you think about it a little bit, you have the meter that you're using, and it does have an AC switch, and it does have a DC switch, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're on DC, and you connect the red to the positive and the black to the negative, the needle will swing and give you some sort of reading. What happens when you reverse it? Smacks the left side. Smacks, it goes past zero and smacks the left side. Now, if you're like the other students, not you guys, you go, first you start backwards, it goes, eh, and then you, what, I don't try know. It again. Try it again, do it again, eh, still doing it, I don't know. Let's we'll try it a different way. Best to try it a third time. <laughs> then you switch it to AM's meter and try it that way. Yeah, then, you know, then, yeah no, then they switch it to DC negative and switch the leads too. So, <laughs> <coughs> so yeah. So, all right, it's so only suitable for measuring DC. Um, AC would just vibrate, so AC would just vibrate. Then if that's what you wanted, well, that's just fine, because uh, it continually reverses. All right, so now we need to, we have the de ball, and that makes perfect sense, I would hope, does to me. So now we want to look at something that would work for DC or AC movements, meter movements. So what do we have here? All right, so this one here, they call it a dynamometer movement front view. Um, in this particular one, um, we'll just kind of dissect it a little bit. And we have a stationary electromagnet. Um, let me see. Use an electromagnet instead of a permanent magnet. Well, that's right. Okay. Um, so then we had an electromagnet which had a permanent like north and a permanent south. This one's wired to your electricity. So notice there's no permanent magnet. So if this is positive and this is negative, then electricity, we'll use conventional theory, is going to flow this way, up this way, and down. And there's a right-hand rule of thumb, left-hand rule of thumb. I don't get into those because then it gets confusing with, well, is that conventional or not conventional? But using a rule of thumb, we'll say right hand, you can show the flow of current 
and then which way the, elect the electromagnet flows will dictate how this works and that would flow that way and out and make this a north and this a south and at the same time it's going to flow this way and up through this way and make this one a it's got to go they kind of drew this one funny so i guess it'd be this would be a north and this would be a south so it sort of attracts it in this would use an attraction can you see that so as this became more north and this becomes more north it's going to overcome the spring and that right there is going to twist until it's like that which would be I don't, know, I, don't know. I don't like the way they drew it, but but you can see how I would have to, because I don't think you could do a repulsion here, because if you made this a, a south and it repulsed, it would go backwards. But you see what I'm saying right there? Yes. So those wires that are wrapping around, is that creating the magnetic field? This right here? Yeah. This right here is creating magnetic field. Yeah. This is exactly <laughs> like your relay. Wrap a bunch of wires. Put a current through it, makes a magnet. And if it was a relay, it would just have a bar that goes click and let current pass through. But it's not. So electromagnet. And we also have an electromagnet right there. So you have two electromagnets. Follow? Mm -hmm. All right. And so that happens during the positive phase of AC. But what happens when we get to the negative phase of AC? Well, go ahead. Will change <clears throat> yep, that becomes negative. This becomes positive. That means that the current is not going to flow that way. So then that way we could say if it's going that way, we could change this to a north and this to a north and this to a south and this to the south and it didn't care and it just kind of stayed where it was. Now I'll tell you that this now that thought about it peaks out stops goes the other way peaks out stops goes the other way so would it be measuring this much no it doesn't it measures about this much so it doesn't measure it it, it, um, it measures an rms root mean squared 0 0.717 <clears throat> but that's for another day so it doesn't it reads a little bit less but now you can see that <coughs> how electromagnets are going to work with each other because we're going to work a lot with electromagnets. A lot, a lot, a lot. They kind of make the world go around. All right, AC, DC meter movement. Let me see. We'll say... Uh, we have two types of analog movements. What do I mean by analog? <clears throat> not digital. Not digital. That's pretty much what it means in aviation. Not digital. I just go not digital because that's our. And what's another name for analog in aviation? What do we call it? Steam gauges. Don't let that confuse you. They do not work off steam. <clears throat> if they do, you have a problem. <clears throat> All right, um, two types of analog movements. I got one, uh, usable on lower frequencies. Uh, depends on the meter, 15 to 1,000 hertz. That means cycles per second. C, Y, A, C, L, C. Let's just try this again. cycles per second. So meters have their limits. When the frequency starts to get really high, they start to get more errors. How do we know about these errors? Meter might start fluctuating, dropping down. Or How do we know that happens? A little bit ago I talked about RMS. How about RFM? This should just, you should, this should just be like in your wheelhouse when I say that. Read, 
the manual. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I don't understand how that's RFM. Read. Read the effing manual? <laughs> <laughs> well, you said it, not me. That's disgusting. Uh, so how would we know if our meter has a problem reading certain frequencies? Read the manual. We'll tell you right in there. So when you're working on an AC project, and maybe I have some sort of question about, you know, what happens to the Simpson meter as it gets into this higher frequency, what would you do? Look at the manual. Look at the manual, and it has a chart in there that shows you what happens at certain frequencies and what the error percentage is. So you would look that up. So uh, if the frequency is too high, you're going to get erroneous readings. All right. Um, I don't know why this is number two, but I have the dynamometer. DY. Sorry. D Y N A M O M E T E R. All right. So that's what we just looked at. It uses two electromagnets. No permanent magnet. And the indicating meter indicating meter always moves in the same direction. Meter always moves in the same direction regardless of Polarity. I have a question. Yes. Um, so in regards to what a, um, a Weston meter versus a, a dynamometer would be, um, wouldn't a Weston meter have to be um, recalibrated more frequently than a dynamometer because of the fact that the Weston meter is using a permanent magnet and those can weaken over time versus a dynamometer which is using an electromagnet which is like powered primarily by an electromagnet? That sounds like more of a statement. <laughs> yes, that's good. That's a good thought. Yeah, I would say so. So AC doesn't necessarily matter, if, like, to I'm sorry for measuring negative versus. Oh, it doesn't matter at all. Yeah, because it's going to switch in. No matter, it's get constantly it's switching. Where it's pretty much. There is no positive in AC uh, wire. It's just. Oh, that's why they're. That's why they say the pole polarity is doesn't fucking matter. Where yeah. You can plug your switch in any different direction you want. Yeah. Three phase. Oh, that's cool. I just realized. <laughs> I learned that. That's yeah, just like, because, uh, cool. well. I'm out of here. That was, that was good. Yeah, it's like, we, yeah. <laughs> which side, look at the outlet. Which side's a positive, which side's a negative? Right, well, your battery, like, hella matters. Yeah, yeah. So if you're going to plug a battery into the wall to charge it up, just, you know, two wires are <laughs> sticking in there. <laughs> okay, don't do that. They still do that. One is bigger, and they and they still get like a polarity on there. I don't actually know why. Some of them are, they, you know, I go back and forth all day when the thing doesn't charge, and it slips back and forth. Yeah, that's <laughs> what you do. Uh, all right, uh, let's see. Um, and then there's the iron vein type, which makes me think of an iron lung, but it's different. All right. The iron vein type. Uh, this particular one uses a coil of wire called a solenoid. solenoid now. A solenoid is something that takes an electromagnet force and just draw and makes mechanical movement. So you have an iron vein. So <coughs> guess what happens? The solenoid sucks that iron vein inside. Sucks that iron vein inside. This becomes an electromagnet. It's looking to electromagnet something, and there's some iron right there. So it just kind of pulls it inside. And it's fought by a spring. So the more that this pulls, the more that this goes in there. So you only have one magnet that's pulling iron, which works. So iron vein. And this can do AC and DC? Yep. Because the solenoids just... It doesn't flicker back and forth. It pulls... Even if it, it doesn't change direction. Right. Otherwise, you'd have to change the winding. 
Yeah, if you think about the relays you guys are using in class, I don't think they have a positive and a negative, do they? No, they didn't. They had, like, you, you could hook it up either way and it would still just merge. Hook it up either which way. And one way, what, does one way attract it and the other way pushes it out further? No. No? It just, so it doesn't matter. That's, that's the way it's wound. So let me see. Needle is attached to iron vein. Iron vein as current flows. The solenoid or the iron vein. Oh yeah, the solenoid, we'll say that. As current flows, the solenoid uh, attracts the iron vein. What I actually wrote, which is much nicer, as current flows through the solenoid, the iron vein is attracted and registered voltage. And just like everything else, a spring counteracts the current. So it's got to fight that spring to register current. Otherwise, just a little bit of current, it would slam all the way to one side. It always measures the max. And lastly, we have the rectifier type, which would make the most sense. And this is, I think, what is the most common these days would be the rectifier type. All right. So the rectifier type will use a bridge rectifier circuit. And I already just explained AC to you. And there, we'll get more into this later about half wave, full wave rectification, but this does a full wave rectification, which takes this signal right here and actually makes it look more like this, inverts it. Half wave would be, it just removes the bottom, um, full wave adds the loop to the top. So at first it can be a little confusing how this works. Uh, because of one concept, what I'll show you. But so we look at this source right here where the negative is, can you guys see that okay? Negative down here, positive right there. So when this goes negative, this is the negative side, and they're going to go negative to positive. So we'll do the same, doesn't matter. Comes up through here, it gets to this point right here. I think I'll use a pen. Comes up, I want red. Red. Comes up through here, and it gets to this point right here. And it, we go back to our diode, which you guys had a diode, right? And so here's a picture of a diode. When the positive is here and the negative is here, what is this called? Anode and the cathode. Yeah, that? yeah, okay, so this would be anode, that's the cathode, but I'm not, not, not make you guys remember that. Uh, we have forward and reverse bias. So which way is which? If this is the positive and this is negative, is it forward bias or reverse bias? Is it on or is it off? on yeah let's get rid of these i don't know why i have those up there this is on forward bias what are you talking what are you talking about what makes it forward bias okay so i didn't bring my notes on this oh, yeah, one the positives connected to the like side of the triangles or yeah so if this positive is on this side of the triangle and the negative is this way it's forward bias and it's on yeah oh it's on um because this is made up of two types of materials, uh, the P and the N, which we talked a little bit about last week, which we'll get into in a couple more weeks. But when the P is connected to the positive, the N is to the negative, then current flows through it. And when you do it the other way around, if I have my diode, and I put a positive right there and a negative right there, this is? Reverse bias. Off slash reverse. reverse. No current can flow through that. So a diode, which you've already played with in lab, it's a check valve. Only allows current to go one way. If you try and do it backwards, what does it do? Stops, stops, it. stops it. Unless you put more voltage on it. If you put a lot of voltage on it, then it will, you know, something. it'll do something. It'll arc across. It'll, you'll get it. All right. So it comes up to this point right here and we're dealing with a negative remember they're showing this drawing backwards so we get to this spot right here you see that right there and 
Maybe I have to make it bigger. But uh, that's not making it bigger at all. That's just making things worse. All right. I wanted this button here, and I'm going to make it bigger. There we go. See that? Now I don't have a... There. Oh, I got my hand. Okay. So it got to this point. Current flew up here. Flowed. Got to this point. It's got a choice. Go this way or this way. Which way is it going to go? Up or is it going to go down? Down. Well, the arrow right there shows oh, it going. going Why is it going up? Because I'm running this thing negative to positive. The negative turns it on. The arrow shows you the direction of conventional flow. The little arrow shows you that's on with the negative. So this one is flowing, and this one is not flowing. So it's going to roll up here. It's going to get to this point. It's negative. Can it go this way? Because that makes that reverse bias. So the only way it can go is this way. It goes down through the load. And that's important that it went down through the load. Comes back over this way, and that's where it gets a little bit problematic. Because now what do we have? Okay, if we had a voltmeter across this and we had 12 volts, what would the voltmeter read across this load? All right, you should have known that. 12 volts, the whole thing. So if we only had 12 volts, had one thing, it's going to drop 12 volts. So we get to over here. Now we're on the positive side. <clears throat> comes to here. It's positive. Can it go this way or that way? It can go to the right. Why can it go to the right? What does this right here say? That's negative. What does this say? Positive. What is that? It's negative. It's also negative. I have two negatives. So how did the positive go through that? Nobody really knows. No. <laughs> okay. There, when you're dealing with this stuff, there's the concept of more negative and less negative. So B is positive, sorry, is negative in relation to D. There's a voltage drop across a diode of about 0.6 volts. Look what D is connected to. We can call that pure positive, unrestricted positive. So if we thought about it this way, this is a positive, and we went across a diode, and we put an LED here in a, in a resistor. So positive, Th let's say this is then um, the full voltage. Would we get a voltage drop across this? Yes. So this would be then slightly, slightly less. less voltage. But we're doing it backwards. So we get here, this is slightly less voltage. This is slightly more. So it's going to flow. Because B is more negative than D. But A is more negative. A was, oh, there's A. Yeah, A was, so there. So it's going to flow through that way. Then it gets to here, but it can't go that way because C is definitely um, going to be, what, more negative than this is more positive. So now it doesn't go that way because this is coming right off the positive right there. This is way more negative, so it can only go here. It's going to get to D and roll down to here. Follow? And remember, it went down through the load. So now we do it again, but this time... This side over here is positive, and this side is negative. It just switched, right? And we can look right there and say it's going to go down through the load. How did it go down through the load? Well, we're going to go backwards because now it's um, <clears throat> negative to positive. So we come up through here, comes up to D. And thank God for the arrows. It makes my life easier. Comes to D. D is negative. So can it go this way? No. no. Nope. So it sees the negative, turns on, it goes to here. And this way would be uh, negative, and that's positive. That's but near positive, so that wouldn't go that way, so it only has one way to go. Goes down through the load, went down through the load, that's the important point, went the same way through the load, back over to here, um, and now we are positive, positive, looking at it again, well, wait a minute, if I'm positive and I got two negatives, why does it work? Because this is slightly more negative than this pure positive, so it goes up through there, down and around. Yes? Are we going to have to wire this in the future, or will this be given to us as a you know, it's not something I've ever had to install in an aircraft. I just, but that's not, and I don't think you would. Dude, this is exactly what I was asking you earlier today. Yeah, and I believe that these things right here, you just buy a bridge rectifier circuit. No, but they're hella easy to make anyway. <coughs> it's just four diodes you and some soldering. Just, you just, yeah, you just solder them <laughs> yeah. each corner together anyway. It's time consuming, but I believe you can just buy, buy a little rectifier. Yeah. But all right, so that, the point is, this will always change AC into what? DC. DC, a full wave rectification. 
So, all right, so the rectifier type um, uses, uses a rectifier to send current through the meter in one direction. Uh, with AC, uh, with AC, the meter reads in RMS, which stands for root mean square. And if we kind of dissect that word, um, root, like square root, mean means average. And so it's the square. So it's really the square. You square the average, take the square root of that, and then figure out the average. Which, in other words, if you looked at an AC waveform, and this is zero, what's the average? Zero. The average is zero. So you take all these numbers, which are positive, and add them up. And all these numbers, which are negative, and add them up, add the whole thing together, and you'd get zero. But if you took everything and squared it, then it becomes positive. everything becomes positive. But you take the square root to undo that, and then you get a number, and then you take the average of all of those numbers. You've got to figure the average of this is, you know, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. It's not going to be up here. So you take the averages of all this hump, and you're going to get something that is roughly about... 0.707, I think I said 717 a minute ago, but. Uh, so you're going to get 0.707. So uh, with AC, the meter reads in RMS, which is root mean square, which is 0.707 times the peak. And we'll get more into that at a, at a different time. But I want, if I think if I repeat it enough, when we get there, we're like, oh, yeah, I, I know that already. <clears throat> so that's 707, that's like an actual... It's an actual thing. An actual thing. So if I took an oscilloscope and I plugged it into the wall... Let me think. And I will get one, one voltage... Um, like 155 volts so I would measure with the if I, if I was expecting 110 I would get more than 110 with an oscilloscope you go that goes way over but then I took my Simpson meter put on AC and plug in the wall I'm gonna get 110 so the oscilloscope is gonna read much higher way up here and the Simpson is gonna read down here so the two are not gonna match because the Simpson reads in or a meter reads in well, doing, uh, RMS. RMS, which is 707. So what is that or 717? 0.707. Oh, I, thought it was 0.717. I told you, I said, I, I think I actually said 717 a minute ago, but it's 707. I don't know. So you can do that, you can measure it in RMS and then just multiply by. Absolutely. Divide it by point. 0.414. 1.414. I don't really know the difference. I think they're all digital, but they're okay. you get a screen. Yeah, the CRT versus the digital screen. I think they're all CRT, though. Okay. I think ours are CRT. Digital analog. Yeah, so it's digital analog, man. It's ball bearings <laughs> and stuff. It's so parallel. What I mean is you can take RMS and divide it by 0 0.707 and get your Um, No, it's 1.414. Well, that could, I mean... I think it's four and four. Oh yeah, you could do that. You could divide it by. It. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, or multiple, or anyway, we'll get into that. I don't want to say the wrong number again. I already said seven one seven. When I'm throwing out numbers, I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one second. There you go. So it is. So 
Um, well, I can just do this since I opened this can of worms. So um, we would call it effective versus peak voltage. So we have peak. This is not number three now because I'm not. This is peak right here. So it goes from the zero up. That's peak from zero to max. We call that peak voltage. Um, peak to peak is from here to here. Again, it's, a, it's something we'll do in like two weeks from now. Um, so the RMS, I'll call it RMS for now, RMS equals 0 0.707 times peak. And then we could do, um, I don't want to say this, peak equals 1.414 times the RMS RMS value. So if you plug in your meter and you got 110 volts for your Simpson, and you said, well, that is, what's 110? What is that? RMS, okay, that's RMS, and I want to know what the peak was. I would multiply 110 times, 1.414. and what do I get? 110 times 1.414 equals 155. Yeah, so that's really 155. Yeah. What does it say after RMS on the bottom one? Value. Okay. And then once we get to higher Hertz ratings. Then we need to account for a... It starts throwing the meter off. But for now, we don't have to worry about that. Let me see. Um, all right, so this is what I was going to say. Where I got off. But that's good stuff. Um, all, note, what do I have? Note, note. Uh, all voltage meters, all voltage meters need current flow to register. Why do we need current flow? You have to create the electromagnet? You have to create the electromagnet. Every single one of them has some sort of electromagnet, pretty much, except for the, um, the bridge circuit. But I didn't finish showing it to you. Maybe that would be helpful. They all need current flow because what happens? Even though you run it through a bridge rectifier circuit, what happens when it gets up here? It's going back to its electromagnets. So now we need electromagnets. So every single one's got some sort of electromagnet. Electromagnets need current flow in order to work. It's the current flow, current through a wire, gives it the two things, heat and Right, but now we can just eh, heat, whatever. Now we just uh, give, gonna give us magnetism. It's gonna make it work. So we gotta have that. So all voltmeters need current flow to register. So we could say that, um, let me see, that it's really an ammeter calibrated to show us voltage. voltage. A lot of things in aviation work that way. You know, fuel gauge is just, it's, it's not. A fuel gauge tells us how much fuel in the tank. Like, it's just, it's a float that works off resistance. So it's like a little ohm meter. So it's an ohm meter calibrated to read gallons. Um, let me think. Fuel flow meters in a lot of aircraft are simply fuel pressure gauges calibrated to read gallons per hour. It's just a pressure gauge. They just erased the little PSI and wrote gallons per hour. If it's this many power, PSI, it's going to be that many gallons per hour. So it uh, works that way. I think it's break time. It is break time.